Good morning, church. Yes, it's wonderful for me to be back with you guys. Uh, we had a break last week from the series because I was not around, and uh, we're going to continue in our series again. But before we go to that, all right, just let me address those on this side again. All right, you have been sitting like this for the couple of weeks already, and uh, today what we want to encourage you. Oh, you see, there's this uh, survey form, right? Uh, you, what you all do now is you all take the survey form. Uh, you can do it later, you can do it now. You look at the survey form, there's a first page, it talks about where you used to sit and where you are sitting now. Okay, just try to figure it out. Lah. If it's too difficult for you to figure out where you used to sit and where you are sitting now, don't worry. All right? The other page is where we want to hear your opinions and whether that, you know, uh, how this sitting is for you, whether it's uh, how, how, how your feedback on how this uh, conducive, this sitting is. All right? And so fill it up. And after the service, there is a little box at the back there, right at the back there where my finger is pointing. Drop it in that box over there. Those of you who do not want to fill it up, no problem meaning you have no feedback, no issue. But those of you who would like to give us your feedback, there's a box right there, and then just do uh, drop it in the box at the back there. All right, and for the rest of you, let's take out your sermon notes. And before that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Saviour, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all honour and all glory. And Lord, this morning, we ask for your Spirit to come and fill our midst once again. Your Spirit to come and speak to us. Your Spirit to come and minister to us. Lord, help us, Lord, to see what you're saying to us in our lives, about our lives today. And Lord, help us to change. Help us to do what you want us to do. We just commit this time unto your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alright, so take out your sermon notes. And we're continuing on our series on the Nali Fire series. And for those of you who just happened to be joining us this week and you have no idea what we're talking about, this series basically deals with attitudes in our lives, issues in our lives, things in our lives which basically nullify God's work in us. That many times we come to church year in, year out, and we serve and we do all the right things. We read our Bible, we worship the Lord, we serve, we tithe, we give, we do everything right. But somehow, we don't seem to grow. Somehow, we are not getting closer to God. And the reason for that is because there are things in our lives which nullifies the effect of all the good, all the right things that we are doing. And so we have seen quite a few of these things the last few weeks. And today, I'm going to talk about one area that affects many of us and which is one, perhaps one of the biggest, the most destructive nullifier in our lives. And there's none other than hurts, than being hurt in especially broken relationships. Relationships that are broken, relationships that, 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 that went through hurts. And many times we Christians, we go through hurts. We come to church, we'll go through hurts. And we're going to unpack what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. We're going to unpack the whole thing that Paul is talking about on what he has to say about broken relationships, about hurts in relationship. And that's what Paul says, you know, in Philippians 2, 2, he started by saying, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Maintaining the same love, united in spirit and intent on one purpose. You know, in other words, what Paul is saying, you know, if there's one purpose, if there is one thing that you will make my joy complete, I want you to be united. I want you to be in right relationships. I want you to be in good relationships, then there will be no hurt, there will be no brokenness, but you'll all be in right relationships. You know, one thing about us is this. Hurts is unavoidable. You know, you come to church, you meet people, you got people in your life. As long as you have people in your life, hurts become unavoidable. In fact, not only if you have people in your life, you know, there's a story told of this man. He was on a ship and he was stranded. The ship capsized and he was stranded on an island. For many, many years, for 30 years, he was stranded on an island. And after 30 years, it so happened a ship was passing by and he managed to signal the ship and the ship came and rescued him. And when the, ship, when the sailors came to rescue him from the island, they asked the man, hey, how come I see got three buildings over there? He said, oh, because I've been here for so long, 30 years I've been here, I managed to find time to build myself simple buildings. They said, okay, so why, but why are there three? What's the one in the middle? Oh, the one in the middle, that is my house. That's the one I live in. Okay, what about the one on the right? Oh, the one on the right, that is my church. Every Sunday, I will go there to worship the Lord. Okay, what about the one on the left? Oh, that was the church I used to go to before we split. 
Even when you're alone, you can get hurt. Even when there's nobody around you, you get hurt. You know what more when there's people? The moment we have people in our life, we will get hurt. And if you want to grow in the Lord, and if you want to continue to let God do His work in your life, we need to learn to deal with these hurts. Because otherwise, if we let this hurt stay in our hearts and in our lives, it nullifies everything that God is trying to do. It nullifies all the work of the Spirit in your life. In fact, it is so important that Jesus even said this. In Matthew 5, Jesus said this, If therefore you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your offering there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. You see, you know what Jesus is saying? You know when you come to the temple and you offer your gifts, all right, we're not, we don't go to the temple today, we don't bring dead cows and dead goats and whatever to put in the altar, no. But what Jesus is saying is that when you come to church, when you come to worship the Lord, what Jesus is saying is that, you know, you stop your worship, you leave your worship and you go and make your relationships right. In fact, relationships are more important than your worship. That you know, if you have broken relationships, if you have relationships that, is, that there needs to be healed, if you have hurts in relationships, Jesus is even saying that you leave your worship in the sun. You leave your worship. You leave your worship in church and you go and heal those relationships. And when those relationships are healed, now you come back and you worship me. It is that important. Why? Because if we don't resolve it, it nullifies God's work in our lives. And God knows that if you harbour those hurts, you give the devil a foothold. That's why Ephesians 4 says this, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. You know, a story is told of this couple, husband and wife, and they, they, they decided, they, one day they, their marriage went sour and they wanted a, a divorce, and it was a very messy divorce. And the husband was so insistent that he wants to keep the house. And the divorce was so bitter in the wife, in the end, the wife said, okay, you can have the house on one condition. I want to keep rights, and I want to give, be given the rights over one nail that is protruding on the front door of the house. The rest of the house you can have, that one nail belongs to me. Husband said, okay, la, good deal. Get the divorce done. Get the house, give you the one nail. After a few months, the wife brought a, took a dead carcass of a dead dog and hang it on that one nail that belonged to her. After a day, after a month, after a month, it became so unbearable, the husband can't even stay in that house anymore. Okay, I'm not giving wives ideas, okay? <laughs> but what I'm saying is this. That when we give the devil a foothold, even if it's one nail in our lives, even if it's one small little foothold in our lives, the devil will come and will destroy everything. The stench of the enemy will wipe out your entire, everything that God is doing in your home, in your lives, in your house. And that is how terrible it is. And that's why we need to deal with broken relationships. We need to deal with the hurts. And the hurts in our lives, friends, the hurts in our lives will change us. It definitely will affect us. But it's your choice whether it affects you for the better or for the worse. Whether it makes you bitter or it makes you better, it's all up to you. And someone once gave this saying, you know, someone once said this, you know, harboring hurts or harboring bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping for that fella to die. You drink poison while waiting for that fella to die. I give you a Malaysian version for that. You know, harboring bitterness, harboring hurt, is like hugging a durian so that that fella don't get to eat it. It hurts. You grab it. You, I'm not going to let you have it, and I'm going to grab it and hug it. It hurts. And many times that's what happens. We, we hold on to our bitterness. We hold on to our hurts. We hold on to whatever it is. The only person that it hurts is you. The only person it hurts is you. And so today, what can we learn from Paul when it comes to dealing with our hurts? Let's go back again, you know, in Philippians 2. You know, what, the first point of your notes, you can write. The first point of your notes, you can write there, it is not about you. It's not about you. 
Okay, Philippians 2 says this, if therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, do nothing from selfish ambition, but with humility, regard each one more important than yourself. You see, what Paul is saying is this, you know, if there is everything, if there is anything, all this is not about you. There are so many things that's more important. It's not about you. When you get hurt, when there's a broken relationship, it's not about you. Tell your neighbor, it's not about you. Tell your neighbor, it's nothing to do with you. It's not about you. All right? It's not, you know, but the problem is when we get hurt, all the time we think it is all about us. But God has a greater plan. Very often when the hurt occurs, God has a greater plan. But many times our focus is just about us about me, what I'm feeling, what I'm going through, but there's something greater. And the classic example of this is in the book of Genesis about the story of Joseph. We all know the story of Joseph. He was betrayed by his brothers. His brothers threw him in the well, wanted to murder him, and they said, hey, no, 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 sell him, you earn more money. And so they sold him into slavery. And as we know the story, that even when the brothers came during famine, and there was a famine in the land, Joseph rose up to become a prime minister of Egypt. And when the brothers came begging for food, they couldn't recognize him. And they showed no remorse. But the Bible tells us that Joseph forgave them. Even though the brothers had no remorse, even until the end of their life, Joseph forgave them. And the reason he could do that was in Genesis 50, 20, Joseph said this, And as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. What Joseph was able to do was this. Joseph saw the saw it's not about him. All that had happened to him, all that the brothers did to him, all the hurts that was was that he and went through, it's not about him. God had a greater plan. God has something greater in mind. There's something that God wanted to do in his life. That God wants to that God wants to have to have happen in through him. And if he had harbored that hurt, he would have nullified everything that God wanted to do. He would have nullified everything that God wanted to use him for. If he had con- con- kept that hurt. But when he cooperated with God, when we cooperate with God and the Lord works in our lives, that what his greater plan would come to pass because the hurts is not about us. It's never about us. But when we cooperate with God, like how Joseph did, he cooperated with God. He brought about the salvation of the entire nation of Israel. He brought about the salvation of the people who were starving. He brought about salvation for the whole world. Because his heart cooperated with God. So how do we start letting go of our hurts? How do we start forgiving the hurts that have been done to us? Number one, would you write in your notes? Number one, have the humility to see the best in people. Let me go back to Philippians 2 again. It says this, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. You see, friends, it's not just talking about thinking people that, you know, you're better than me or this type of thing. Not just that. But look what Paul was saying. Again, in Philippians 2, 3 says, but with humility of mind, let each one of you regard others better. With humility of mind. You see, friends, it is an attitude of thinking of others better than yourself. You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, okay, you know we, we, we don't think, think of people better. We always think the worst. I mean, just imagine the people that have hurt you. All right? The minute I say that, I know all of you, you have faces that will come into your mind. People who have hurt you. All right? Don't pretend. I know there is. Imagine these people. Those who have hurt you. What do you think of them? Do we always think of the worst do we always think how bad they are, how terrible they are? But you know, that's not how we are designed. That's why when we do that, uh, our hearts become so rotten. Because we are, we are not designed that way. Our human nature is designed to always look at the best in things. Let me give you an example. All of you go for holidays, right? You all go holiday, travel here, travel there. And when you go for holiday, you all snap photos. In fact, today, uh, I think we all, with the digital camera, uh, we step maybe one million photos by the time we come back. Right, just snap. We snap. And then when you come back home from your holiday, 
Then you're going to start selecting the photos that you want. How do you do it? Okay, the photo where I, uh, I got stain on my clothes. Okay, that's the one I take. Oh, the photo where my hair is uh, messy. I take that photo. Oh, the photo where I'm drooling, with, I take that photo. Do you do that? No. You take the best photos. You take the ones that where you look the prettiest, where the angle is so numb, it gives out your best side, you know. Then people will see, wow, so pretty, even though this side is so ugly, but they see the pretty side only. We do that. Huh? Ask my wife when she choose photos. Uh, Ay, yo. But that's what we do. We will choose the best. We will look in and look and look and we will find the best. Even one wrinkle, even one white hair, all we don't want. We want the best. And that's what we are default to do. That's what we are designed to do. That's how we operate. But somehow when it comes to hurts and relationships, right, when it comes to relationships that have been broken, we tend to focus on all that hurts and we don't look at the best that has happened. We don't look at the best of the relationship. We don't look at the best of the good times. I mean, as a, hus- as a pastor, I've counseled so many couples who were come because of marital problems. And many times, I would just ask them, were there ever good times in your marriage? Then reluctantly, they would say, yeah. Were there times when you felt close together? Reluctantly, yes. And so many times, we would focus on the things that is hurting us now rather than all the good and all the blessings in that relationship that was there before. And so friends, you know, we, we, thinking the best of others, seeing the best in others, is not denying the faults that they have, it's not denying the things that they have done, no. But it is recognizing that this relationship is more important than whatever that has happened. That this relationship is more important than the hurts or the misunderstanding that took place. This relationship is more important than whatever that you have said or you may have said or you may have done. No, this relationship is more important. And because of that, I would choose to focus on the best. On the best. The reason why we need to do that is this, friends. Because I remember I told you it's not about you. God wants to do a greater work in your life. But when we are focused on all the bad of the the worst in the relationships, and we are focused on the worst of the hurts, we are not able to see what God is trying to show us about our lives. And that's why we need to change our focus. We need to have the humility, the, the state of mind to see the best in relationships so that we can see what God is trying to show us. You know, it's like this man who came to see the doctor. He said, you know, doctor, I'm, I, I feel pain. Everywhere I, I have pain. You know, I touch here, I got pain. I touch my head, I got pain. I touch my chest, I got pain. I touch my leg, I got pain. I touch everywhere, I poke everywhere, I'm full of pain. The doctor checked him, do all the tests and say, nah, you know what's the problem? You have a broken finger. <laughs> and sometimes it's like that. When we are focused on the worst in other people, when we are focused in the pain that they are causing, we don't realize the broken finger that we have. But when we begin to see the best in relationships, then now what we are doing is our heart is cooperating with God. Like Joseph, our heart is now cooperating with God. And now we can see what God is trying to do and the broken fingers in our lives, the brokenness in us, the hurts in us, the things in us that, that, that God wants to show us. You see, the key to realize is this, you know, that feeling hurt may be a sign that something is broken. Feeling hurt may be a sign that something is broken in us, that something in our hearts is broken, something in our lives, something in our character, something in our spirit is broken. But we don't realize that if you're focusing on the the worst in people, you won't see the brokenness that is inside of us. Some of us, we carry a spirit of rejection. That whenever someone says anything remotely rejectful, we get hurt. And the problem is not him, but the rejection that I carry. Some of us, we carry a a baggage of of, uh, lack of love. And because we carry that lack of love or a baggage of low self-esteem, anyway, although when someone says something, there's no insult intended, but because we carry this baggage of a low self-esteem, we feel the hurt. We feel the pain. And And when we stop focusing on people and we start seeing the best in them, we begin, the Lord will begin to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to show us these areas in your life. And so what Paul is saying is this, try not to look at the worst in people, but just to see them, 
with the best so that you can recognize your own brokenness rather than other people's brokenness. But pastor, what about the wrong that was done to me? What about the evil that was done to me? You know, I mean, I was, I was the victim. You know, I was really wrong. He, he did something that's wrong. I was the victim. What about that? Well, would you write the next point of your notes, number two? Your rights are not always right. Your rights are not always right. Philippians 2.5, it says this. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grabs, but emptied himself, taking the form of a born servant and being made in the likeness of man. Jesus didn't see his rights as being the son of God, as being in the likeness of God. That Jesus didn't see his right as God to be right. He didn't grab it. He didn't grab his right as God. But he came down. He came down to earth to be hurt, to be beaten, to be betrayed, so that he can heal our relationship with God. So that he can bring restoration to the relationship. Jesus didn't care about his rights. He didn't care whether his right is right. You know, we have a lot of rights in, the li- in our lives. You know, we have a lot of rights. It is my right to spend my money any way I like. But any way I like may not always be the right way to spend my money. Isn't that true? And we have a lot of rights in this world. But all, not all the time our rights is the right thing at the moment. You know, oftentimes when my wife and I get into an argument, and most of the time, I'm right, she's wrong. She won't, she won't agree with me, but I'm right, she's wrong. And you know, and a lot of times we're arguing and we're just unhappy about something. And I just want to sit, you know, and in my mind, I would sit there and I would have all the reasons why I am right. I would have all the points and all the arguments that I can give to prove that I am right. And I'm just playing in my head how to, to, to say it, to show that I'm right and insist that I'm right and hold my ground that I am right. And in the midst of doing that, the Lord would just whisper to me, does it really matter? Does it really matter? You may be right, but is it worth the relationship? You may be right, but is it worth the brokenness in the relationship? You may be right, but is it right? We have a lot of rights. We have a right to vengeance. We have a right, you know, when people hurt me, it is my right to to, to retaliate. It is my right to defend myself. It is my right to protect myself. It's my right. But is it always right? Today, you know, we don't don't take revenge by killing people. We don't. But we take revenge in a lot of other subtle ways, don't we? Like we take revenge by by withdrawing or giving silent treatment. Refuse to talk to you for the whole year, whole day, whole year, whole month. Or we, 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 we take vengeance by, being, by belittling the other person, saying hurtful words to the person. Or we take revenge by putting the other person on a guilt trip. Or we take revenge by holding a grudge. Or we take revenge by bursting out in anger and then shouting or screaming. Or actually the most subtle one that most of us will not admit to. We take revenge by rejoicing in their pain and their hurts. Oh, that fellow hurt me one. Ah. Ayo, he got cancer. Ah. Wah, praise the Lord. Like, hallelujah, like, he got cancer. We don't say it to him. Lah, but in our hearts, yes, he got what he deserved. And we rejoice. And we take vengeance in our hearts. That's why Romans 12 says this, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. In other words, what Paul is saying, for the sake of relationships, lay down your rights. Lay down your rights to vengeance. Lay down your rights to defend your heart. Lay down your rights to your self-centeredness. Like Jesus laid down his right. That's why we have salvation today. You lay down your rights. Even when you feel hurt, you lay down your rights. Why? Because forgiven people forgives. And a lot of times, why we are unable to lay down our rights and forgive and to let go is simply because we have not 
realize the magnitude of our forgiveness. Because forgiven people will forgive. It's like the parable that was told in Matthew chapter 18. Let me read to you very quickly. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a certain king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, there was brought to him one who owed him 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents is about uh, 2.7 billion ringgit today. Okay, not million, uh, billion. But since he did not have the means to repay, his lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children, and all that he had and repayment to be made. The slave, therefore, falling down, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. But the slave went out, and, as a, and the lord of the slave felt compassion, and released him and forgave him the debt. But the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. A hundred denarii is about 4,000 ringgit, okay? So 2.7 billion, 4,000 ringgit. And he seized him and began to choke him and saying, pay back what you owe. So this fellow slave fell down and began to entreat him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. He was unwilling, however, but went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you entreated me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave, even as I had mercy on you? And his lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should pay all that was owed him. So shall my heavenly Father do to you if each of you does not forgive his brothers from your heart. You see, friends, what the Lord is saying is basically this. This servant, he did not realize the magnitude of what was forgiven. And that's why to him, he will go back and grab that 4,000 from one, even though he was forgiven 2.7 billion. Likewise for us, if you want to be very honest with ourselves, the reason why many of us are unable to let go of the hurts it's because we don't realize the magnitude that God has forgiven us. We don't realize how much God has actually forgiven us. And we don't see what God has forgiven us as being so huge that in comparison to what people do to us, it doesn't matter. But, the reason, but because we harbor those hurts, and we, when we see God's forgiveness as so little, we hurt. We get hurt. And we keep those hurts. Forgiven people forgive people. Hurt people hurt people. Forgiven people will forgive. Hurt people will hurt people. And sometimes we just do that because we want to hold on to that rights, that rights to hold it for, for that hurt, that rights for vengeance, that rights to protect myself, that rights to prove myself right, that right to, to, to guard my, my heart, that right to, to, have, to have my last say. And because we want to hold that right, we are willing to destroy relationships because of that right. It's like a story told of this man, you know, in South Africa. He was killed by an oncoming car, a, a bus rammed him and he died on the spot. And the reason he died from, from the bus ringing was this. Because when he was walking on the street, his head flew off. And he was chasing after the head. And as he was chasing after the head, he ran out of the road to catch the head. The bus hit him and he died. And when I read the, read the story, I was like, what a stupid man. Because of a head, he lost his life. Today, I wonder how many of us are like that. Because of that head of vengeance, that head of I am right. That head of I don't want to, I want to protect my heart. That head of, you know, I don't want to be taken advantage of. That head, because of that head, we kill relationships. We kill friendships. We kill people in our lives because of that head. And that's why we need to maintain healthy relationships. And finally, the third thing that we need to do, the third thing, fight to the death. Right, the fight to the death. Philippians 2.8 says this, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus was obedient until the point of death on the cross. But let's be honest. What makes Jesus' death on the cross so, so great or so pain? So, I mean, you know, we always say, oh, the death on the cross is such a painful death. To be very honest, huh? Jesus was not the only person who died on the cross, you know. There are thousands and thousands of people who have died on the cross. 
And dying on the cross is also not the most painful death today. You want to think, you want to think of the most painful way? There are more painful ways to die. You ask the Nazis, they will tell you there are more painful ways to die. There are more painful ways that we can inflict on other fellow humans to torture and to kill them. But do you know what was so great about Jesus' death? Other than the fact that he was the son of God dying for our sins? Was that this, that when he hung on the cross, and when he looked at all the people who put him there, all the people who was hurling insults at him, who was cursing him, who was calling him names, all those people in front of him. And Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. And to me, that was the power of the cross. That when Jesus, even to the point of death, it made the cross so precious because Jesus was willing to forgive. And that kind of forgiveness can only come through obedience. That's why Jesus obeyed to the point of death. Yes, you will struggle. You will wrestle with it. You will, it hurts. Like Jesus, Jesus struggled. Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he wrestled with God. He said, Lord, I don't want to do it. I don't want to go through it. I cannot. It's painful. I don't want. I'm wrestling with it. But in the end, it was obedience that made it happen. Jesus, because step of obedience, took it to the cross and forgave everyone in front of him. You know, for us, we are, not, we are not used to forgiving. And we have to go through a process. But it's that obedience that, that will help us to go through that process. And the process always starts, you know, when you start forgiving someone, it always starts, there's three stages to it. First is what I call the awkward stage. It starts very awkward. Uh, I, 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 I for, for forgive you. Lah. I, I, I forgive. I f -f -f forgive. You know, very awkward. I just don't know how to say it. I just don't know how to let go. It starts awkward. It will always be that. But you know, we just need to do it. You just need to be out of obedience, just do it. Just do it out of obedience. Even if you have to die to yourself, you have to die to your pride, just do it. Even though it's awkward, just do it. After the awkward stage, it becomes what we say, mechanical. You get into the mechanical stage. I will forgive you. Okay, I will forgive you. It becomes mechanical. You are just doing it. You just become mechanical. That's, that is, and, and after you've gone through that, it becomes natural. And then now, forgiveness becomes natural. Pop, you hurt me? It's okay. I forgive. You do something wrong? It's okay. I forgive. And we all have to go through this stage. If you want to make it natural in our lives, we have to go through the, the awkward stage, the mechanic stage, and, it, and it become, before it becomes natural. You know, but, you know, for a moment, I just want to pause a minute uh, and just speak to the wives here for a moment. Uh. Husband, close your ears. You know, wives, sometimes, you know, when your husband comes home and, you know, your husband does something and he say, okay, wife, I'm sorry. You know, sometimes for you wives, uh, don't be so hard on him, you know. Don't say, ah, yeah, you say sorry, not con not, you're not con sincere. La. You know, you're sorry, you're just saying it, you're not sincere. You know, be, be merciful. He's going through that process. He's going through a process from awkward to mechanical. And sometimes, although he comes and says sorry, it sounds mechanical. It doesn't sound sincere, but he's going through that process. Alright, so don't, don't, don't crucify him for going through that process. Don't crucify him. Don't stop him or discourage him from going through. Let him go through it. Because he needs to go through from the awkward to the mechanical before it can become natural and sincere and truly from the heart. Likewise, for us, when we want to forgive, we have to go through it. And a lot of times in our mind, that's all we have to do. Okay, the hurt comes, all right, I forgive, I let go. All right, it comes again, I let go. All right, fine, it comes again, and I just have to keep letting go, even though it's mechanical, even though I don't feel like it, even though I'm not convinced about it, I just need to let go and let go and let go until it becomes natural. Pastor, how long will this whole process take? How long will it take? Very simple. The more often you do it, the faster. <laughs> and that's why Jesus, you know, when Peter came to Jesus and asked, Peter asked Jesus in Matthew 18, he said, Jesus, you know, how many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? He said, no, 70 times, seven times. Why? Because that's what you need. You need to keep doing it. You need to keep letting go. In your mind, you just need to keep forgetting it. You know, you can forget it. Okay, I forget the hurt today. Okay, I forgive. The next second, it comes back again. Okay, I forgive. Two seconds later, it comes back again. And you just need to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it 
until it becomes natural. And then when, even when the hurts come, you don't even realize it's there, it just goes away. And it no longer hurts you. I'm going to close with this story. You may have heard the story of this guy. His name is Bruce Murakami. You may have heard him with his story before. His wife, he was, he, his wife and daughter was killed in a, elite, in a street racing. Someone was racing on the streets, rammed into their, his wife and daughter's car, and they died. He witnessed the whole thing. And at first, the police thought that it was a normal road accident. They didn't want to press charges. Bruce Murakami made it his life mission to nail that person who was racing on the road. He went, he hired a private detective, he went to court, he collected evidence, he did all for three years, he worked on the case to get to prove that person was racing. And finally, that person was charged in court. But Bruce, something happened. God intervened. And rather than seeing that person sent to jail, Bruce forgave that person and pleaded for his life. Let's just watch a short clip about his story. November 16, 1998, a car racing down Hillsborough Avenue in Tampa slams into a minivan with Cindy and Chelsea Murakami inside. The minivan hit another car and then burst into flames. Bruce Murakami just happened to be close by and went to the accident scene. As he got closer, he broke down in tears. I realized I, one, one of the vehicles was a van, and I just had a sick feeling, and I had to confirm it. Justin Cabezas was racing another car over 90 miles an hour when he slammed into the van. Initially, prosecutors didn't file charges. I was angry. I was livid. And yeah. part of my, yeah. oh yeah, part of my old self was, you know, let me find this punk because I'm going to take care of him. Bruce admits his life went into a tailspin of depression. The first year, I, I think I was just a walking zombie. I sold my business and I just sat on the beach every single day. I just couldn't figure out what to do. I mean, I put my Bible down. I just didn't want anything to do with God, nothing. Why me? Yeah. But he bounced back and began to work hard on the case with a private attorney. Three years later, Cabezas was charged with two counts of vehicular manslaughter. But something happened when Bruce finally saw Justin in court. He wasn't the monster he envisioned. That's when this father's fight for justice turned into a father's fight for forgiveness. So I started preaching to myself on forgiveness. And even though I've never met this kid, I started forgiving him for what he did. That's a lot of forgiveness, Bruce. I got I to gotta be honest with you. It was, it was tough, Roger. Cabezas was facing up to 30 years in prison if convicted. But Bruce shocked the court. He asked the judge not to send him to jail. The driver of the car that caused the crash was a 19-year-old male. He walked away with minor injuries, as did the driver of the SUV. I'm Justin Cabezas. And yes, I'm the one that crashed into Mr. Murakami's car and killed Cindy and Chelsea Murakami. My life was good. I had a good family, good friends, a bright future. The thought of something bad happening to me just didn't make any sense. Justin and Bruce went to hundreds of schools across the country, speaking with thousands of kids about the dangers of speeding. But Bruce also wanted kids to understand, even after tragic mistakes, they too can find redemption like Justin. Yes, I've lost my wife and my daughter. My boys have lost their mom and their sister. But a lot of good has come out of this because this young man and myself are saving lives. Bruce realized it's not about him. That God has something greater in store. And when he was able to forgive, the boy who killed his wife and daughter they went around town. They went all to schools and they began teaching children about the dangers of racing on the streets. But that could only happen if Bruce didn't choose to harbor those hurts and he chose to realize that it's not about me, that God had a greater plan than me. 
And he chose to lay down his rights, to lay down his rights and to forgive. And this morning I pray that as we come to the communion table, that we will tell the Lord, Lord, I lay down my rights. Whatever that hurts may be, I lay down my rights. And I choose to see the bigger things that you are doing. Let us pray. Wonderful Jesus, wonderful Savior, mighty God. Lord, we give you all the praise, all honor and all glory. And Lord, this morning, as we prepare ourselves for communion, Lord, may you check our hearts once again. Lord, show us the hurts that we still hold in our hearts. Some of these hurts may be so old. It could be 10, 20, 30 years. Even some of the people who have hurt us may have long gone, but yet we still hold on to the hurts. Lord, this morning, as we come before your table, help us to lay down our rights and let your healing grace change us. Help us to be forgiven people who are truly forgiven so that we too can forgive. Lord, I just commit everyone unto your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.